Hello, my name is Andy O'Neill, and thanks for watching Web Litica TV. I'm joined today by my friend Jonathan Tack. Jonathan lives about five hours west of Dallas, Texas, with his wife and three children. Jonathan is a full-time airline pilot and has logged over 5,300 hours of flight time with 800 of those hours as an instructor. Jonathan built his first database in 2017 to create a tracking platform for the five airplanes his company managed. He then volunteered for a ministry to help build a more efficient management system for that organization. The skills Jonathan learned through that experience shaped how he works today. Jonathan is also a part of the NAC Experts Network. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Andy, for having me. That was a very good introduction. Appreciate My that. pleasure. My pleasure. So let's just yeah. start. Tell me about being a full-time pilot. What's that like? So I call it a most privileged position. Uh, it's certainly a career choice uh, that I made. My dad encouraged me to get into it when I was in um, in junior high. And honestly, I was I had my eyes more towards architecture uh, when I was in high school, but I I didn't really find a way to follow through with that. And I walked through an architect firm and I learned that architects really start by designing like bathrooms and stuff. And I said, I didn't, I don't want to be designing little rooms. I want houses. Right. And when I learned that's not exactly how architects start, then I started leaning more towards, yeah, maybe this pilot thing is pretty cool. So I, uh, I started flying in university, I went to Longview, Texas starting in 2001 and I got a undergraduate degree in aviation and then after I graduated with my instructor licenses I would I was still kind of I didn't have a a hankering desire for aviation or airplanes interestingly enough but when I went up to Alaska everything changed uh, I graduated in 05 and a, a missionary pilot invited me to join him up in Alaska to be a flight instructor, and he was he was having pilots come on to his uh, grass strip in the middle of Alaska, and he needed an instructor to teach them. So I went up there in 05, spent uh, four months from May till September instructing, and I love teaching, and I just, I love the scenery, and I love what, what God was showing me around his creation from the perspective of an airplane. And that was great. Um, That's cool. Yeah, because they use they use small airplanes a lot in Alaska to get out to the remote villages and uh, the remote areas of the of Alaska, right? Yes. Yeah. Alaskans depend um, highly on airplanes. Like it is, it's their bread and butter for a lot of people, and sometimes it's the only way to get bread and butter um, off to these remote villages especially in the winter when the roads are closed, it's too far away to get a snowmobile up there. Airplanes are a lifestyle and they sustain life up there. Um, yeah, that's cool. So let's switch to no code stuff. Um, yeah. So talk a little bit about how you, you have a particular way that you design database structures from scratch. Tell us about that. Yeah. So kind of a, a backstory of can I talk about how I got into NAC? Sure. Because sure. that's, that's, that's real exciting. Um, so uh, as a pilot, we have to go through this flight physical every year. And one time that I was in my flight physical, I had kind of a scare and the doctor like made a call and I had to go see other doctors and all this. And I thought, man, what am I going to do if I lose my pilot's license or, because I lost my flight medical? And I started thinking about other stuff I'd like to do and data and analytics, always something that I enjoy doing. So I, um, long story short, I got into Abilene Christian University and got a, a master's degree in business with an analytics uh, concentration to it. And that's what got me into databases. And I, I found NAC and I developed something very small for my company. I showed it to my manager and to our accountant and they're like, yeah, this could work. So they adopted it and I just kind of kept building and then sold that program to a couple other people. And then um, I got reconnected with a ministry up in Alaska, started building for them. And 
and I figured, hey, let's make a business out of this. So I started being interested in building databases from scratch. And, and now I'll get into the building part. So um, building, yeah, building databases from the ground up, you know, it can be, it can be such a difficult task because building this stuff is so iterative. You start with an idea of what you want, what you want to build and you do something little and then you just start from the middle and you go from the ground up with no end in sight. Like you're building from the inside out. And the way that I, the other career in my life contrasts with this is that I really build from the outside in. Like when I'm flight planning, I have a destination. Uh, like tomorrow I'm supposed to get up early and fly a few people up to near Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> and I've got a destination. I got the, uh, the equipment. I've got passengers. I've got a known fuel load. Everything is known. So I start with this end goal in sight. And then I build everything up to that end. Like with databases, you start with the beginning in sight. And it's so tempting. It's such a a draw to want to start at the beginning, get on the NAC app, throw a few objects in there and kind of whittle your whittle my way in until I get into a log jam. I'm like, oh man, how where do I go from here? Because I just want to get started. I want to get my foot over the start line. And and it, on my screen, I just work until it doesn't make sense, pull back and try something else. You know, a, a big example of this is where do I put people, uh, my contacts, individuals right. in yeah. the database? And everybody that you've interviewed here before, um, well, the three guys that you interviewed here before, uh, Loic, Dave Parrish, and Carl Holmes, they all said, put your people into user roles. Right. And brilliant. Uh, and I, I haven't done that before, but you figure that out through this iterative process. And, um, so we all kind of critique ourselves and we do things differently if we were to go back and build it from the ground up again. And I'm very much like that way too. But like, the question I have is, what is the right way to build and plan? Um, when I was at NatCon in 2019, uh, Gwee Marshall got up and he talked about Plan more, build less. That was just a groundbreaking thought to me because I didn't know how to plan as well as I should. And Gui did such a good job telling how he would he would build the like he would virtually build a project on paper and then he'd give it to one of his employees. He'd say, Okay, here's a plan, you build it on NAC. And that takes such a deep understanding about how databases work, but like, we got to get there. And what does it take to get there? Um, like geniuses in, in music, like uh, Beethoven Mozart wrote hundreds of musical compositions in their lives, their short lifetimes. And even while Beethoven was going deaf, he was still able to write 700 pieces in 45 years. Um, Mozart wrote about 600 in 30 years and they, they got a piece of paper with musical staffs on it and they just wrote it out. They orchestrated it and then they put it in front of the orchestra and they played it. Like, can we be that way with designing a database? Um, and then uh, one, I was having a conversation last month with a, a guy that I just met over the NAC builder community. Um, and he's actually on our, he's actually on our Slack channel right now. And, uh, and, he, and he said, you know, it's somewhat hard to tell the difference between a dynamic, what's going to be dynamic and what's going to be static. And I've been hanging on to that. And I've been um, mulling over that for a while. And you know, he really caught on to something there. And I said, is there, I just felt like there is 
a sense of, yeah, I can, I can make some kind of a decision process to know from the start how my database structure has to be put into place on paper, and then I can go in and that and act and build it. So um, let me let me show you what I've got here. Can I screen share now? Yep, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, as you're pulling that up, I mean it's it's important. I've got I've got NAC apps I've got years on, you know, and so having that foundation correct, even as you build and iterate, as long as your foundation is correct, you're usually okay when you have totally left field requests and things that you need to build. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm screen sharing here. Um, so what can you see right now? I can see database design logic tree. Okay, great. Google box. Yeah. Put that into full screen here. So, uh, I get the I get this idea um, originally, and Alex Ber Alex Bernier has it. So he's part of Slack channel, and Knack picked up on him a couple of years ago in in Chicago, and he made a really nice video for for Knack. And I never knew how he would, you know, put this concept in my mind, but it's been a real blessing to me. So this um. I came up with this like logic tree of how do you how do you decide which data set goes into where and I'm going to spend try to not spend too much time on explaining this but I'll point it out and then show you an app that I made just uh, just real quick so when we start with an app you know let's say we have this car rental reservation app and what I want to do is I want to get all the debt, all the data just out there that I want to deal with. I've got, I know I've got cars and drivers and dates and locations, and I want to get it all out there. Then I want to figure out what does this look like in a database? And every, every little piece of data is going to have to have a right place where you put it and is going to have to behave the way that you put it. Um, it's going to have to interact with other data um, in the, in the correct way. Mm -hmm. And what uh, what Alex kind of the, the thought that he put into my mind in seed form was, okay, yeah, what is dynamic, what's static, and I kind of put that into a template. So the way I got, the way that I go through this is okay, I got. A car reservation and I need to have a car and that car field or whatever it is what does that car element do what do I want it to do well I need it to I'm gonna have a lot of cars so I need that to be dynamic I need to scale it and in addition I want that every car in there I want to draw analytics out of that car too. So I want to be analytic. Well, what should that become? And that's got to become its own object. Um, and uh, same with driver. Going to have a lot of drivers, so I want that list to be dynamic and scalable. And I want to be able to analyze each one of those drivers as well. You know, how many days they've rented and just have that unfold the mushroom out. Uh, for date, you know, a date is going to belong in the particular reservation record, but I can't start from there to figure out my date. I need that to be responsive based on a reservation actually occurring, and it also has to be unique. Um, a date's not going to float, it's going to be fixed. So that's gonna that's gonna be in its own in its own record, and we'll see that later. So you can see how we got car becomes a separate object, driver becomes a separate object, date is just a field within an object. We got location, 
dynamic and analytic becoming its own object. Uh, same for data in. And uh, now we have a second location, dynamic analytic. That's also going to be in an object, but it's going to be the same object as the out location. Right. Um, with agent, now we have a person. This is the agent who signed off the car to whoever the driver was. Uh, the agent, again, is going to be part of a dynamic list, and it's going to be analyzed because we need to know more of what the agent has done. So the agent is going to be in the own object. So that's our fourth object coming into view right then. Um, and then uh, we're going to take this car object. So now we've created the first object. And I've, I call my objects either by, is it a list or it's um, a list that we're going to create dynamically or it's going to be tracking, we track records. And this particular object is going to be for cars. Well, what other attributes does a car have? It's got to have a VIN number and that's, um, so we call that response because you have a, car and then that field has to respond to we have a record of a car so it has a VIN um, and it's unique to each record. We have a license plate number, make, model, those are pretty straightforward but then we have this home location of where that car is based at. We want that to um, be responsive based on having a car record there. It also needs to be analytic. So what happens when we have a responsive and analytic um, attribute there, well, that's going to connect to another object. So now we have to put in another, you know, in, in our original language of parent-child, uh, now we have a, a child, uh, child uh, record that taps off of a parent object. But okay. we know that this is bait, that this is going to be in a parent known as object three. So like the, the home location, <clears throat> excuse me, I was in, my wife and I were in Florida in May and that we went out to pick our car and they all had Florida plates on them, except for the one that said Iowa. I actually got the one from Iowa. Yeah. And so, but obviously that one was not in its home location. Some, at some point it's going back to Iowa if they can get it rented back that way. Yeah. And now with uh, rental cars, basically not being allowed to have one-way rentals because rental cars are so scarce now. Right. We, um, it's hard to get a one-way rental. And then if you do, it's going to cost hundreds of dollars to even get a one-way rental. Right. Okay. Well, this is cool. I love, I love the planning. Um, I'll be honest. I don't do this. I probably should do this more. Um, the planning that goes into, uh, you know, what you're going to do and how you're going to build your app first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm taking uh, a lot of time with that, but just to show you, here's what, um, here's what the schema looks like. Mm -hmm. I've got a listing of cars, all those fields, listing of locations, and then I've tracked the reservations, um, inspections on the cars, and then I got down in the, here in the user roles, the, the driver and the agent. You know, yes, because your people go in user roles. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If it's a person who's going to have a chance at ever logging into this, it goes into a user role. Right. So I, uh, you know, I built this. Well, I planned for about, you know, half an hour. And then I built this in about 15 minutes. And it's, it is uh, just um, scalable, it works, and it makes perfect sense inside of it. So it'll work really well. All right, let's get into the other things that we want to talk to you here. I'm going to stop. Should I stop? No, I'm not going to stop screen sharing because I got other things that I want to show you. All right. So the, uh, the next thing we want to talk about was text messaging. Yes. Right. Um, so this, uh, the mission up in 
Alaska, I had built a huge app for them and it was tracking um, all their contacts. They had nearly 3000 contacts. So, and I, I interact with um, MailChimp, the Integromat, and I've got all their airplanes on there, on their cars. They've got a bunch of housing that they were creating housing reservations for. Um, they have meal schedules that, where we had to count the number of people who were on campus and the meal schedule calendar had to say how many people were projected to be at meals for each given day. And that again was a huge, um, huge integrate scenario. Right. And, um, and the maintenance, the maintenance head told me that some of the students were having trouble putting their flight logs in because they didn't want to get into a computer. They didn't have real good Wi-Fi service up there in, in the bush, uh, but they had cell phone service and right. they could do text messaging. And he said, is there a way that's, those are my four favorite words as a builder. <laughs> is there a way that our students can send their flight logs in using a text message? I said, let me get back to you on that. So I, a perfect, a perfect project for a pilot and a NAC builder, and, you know, and a no code builder. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And every one of these challenges that I've come across, I say, I assume there is a way. And if I can't figure out myself, then I'll go, you know, ask my, my buddies like you or, or a little week and say, do you have an idea about that? Um, but this one, I, I got on my own with prayer and, uh, and on my own. So I found this neat um, app called Twilio, which interacts with your phone and does all kind of text messaging, cool stuff. And Twilio has a product called Flows in it. And you can create automations in Twilio that connect your cell phone to Twilio. And then Twilio has a, uh, an API machine that will send, um, you know, that, that will send a message over to Integromat. And then once it gets into Integromat, I'm golden. Right. Um, so I'm not going to show you the app that I built for uh, the people in Alaska um, because that's mostly actual sending in flat logs and I want to send in a bad, like a flight log that didn't actually happen. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the, the flow for my full-time company, uh, DV Aviation. We manage aircraft out of West Texas. And uh, this particular flow starts with a text message. And what I built into it is I can capture the status of an airplane. I can submit, um, I can submit receipts. Um, into my app and I can do a couple other cool things, but the easiest thing is to get a status from this. So, um, well, so let me is, show you. This is, this is a flow builder inside of Twilio. I've used Twilio yes. just to send texts, but this is a flow builder with logic and branching options. And this is very cool. Yes. Yeah, and I need to enlarge it so we can all see it correctly. So it starts with this trigger, and the trigger is either an incoming message, a call, or an API. So I do everything on an incoming message trigger, and they say, hey, what do you want to happen first? Well, I want this message to come through that says, what would you like to do? And then there's options of what do you want to do. And then once you reply your text message, the next um, the next message come up and say, okay, status, what do you want a status for? And then you reply and then it flows down, down to, and then we have this, um, HTTP request puts a post, um, and then that sends my responses to Integromat. And then that post through the API over to Integromat. And then here's my flow from Integromat. 
So I got this webhook that comes from Twilio, and then a regular expression to collect out of the uh, out of the webhook the information that was sent to it, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it goes through this this whole flow, and in the end, a text message gets sent back to the user of whatever they requested. And we've got a whole bunch of pathways, a bunch of stuff can happen. We've got arrays and iterators and more text aggregators. And um, this, uh, this took a short, short time to build, but it's really fun to see it work. So, so your, your Twilio flow gathers the information from them, gives them the options. I want this or this or this. And then it sends it to Integromat and then Integromat, once you look up the data they need, you're actually sending the reply with the information from Integromat. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. So uh, this one, this is what I did just earlier this morning and say, hey, I want, so I, I send it in to get the automation to start talking to me and then I respond and then it sends me the product that I'm looking for in my text message right there. And so I can do, I can send up a receipt and this stuff is going from Twilio through Integumat into NAC and then back from Twilio um, into my phone. <laughs> um, really, really cool stuff. That is cool. All right. Cool. Do you have um, more screen share to show us? I, that's it. Okay. That's it. So I'm going to okay. stop screen sharing here. So I've heard you talk about uh, designing the impossible with algorithms and conditional rules and formulas. Tell me, tell me about that. I, I'm, I'm guessing some of that is baked into what we just looked at. Yeah, man. I love, I love just seeing math work and a database where you have real complicated formulas um, to get information to pop out that you needed to is, has just been amazing. And um, I know I don't want to take more time showing you the algorithm that I like the best, but in my, uh, my management company, we had this, this puzzle to figure out together where we had two, two different families who owned one airplane together. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to figure out how much that they owe for, you know, they're, if they fly an air, the airplane an hour, if they, they pay a thousand dollars per hour, that's pretty easy to figure out. But fuel is something very different because you can go from here to, to Dallas and pay four bucks a gallon. You can go from Dallas to uh, Kansas city and pay $5 a gallon. Mm -hmm. So say we've got one owner flying from here to Dallas, he pays $4 a gallon. And then he goes up to Kansas City, pays $5 a gallon. But then the other owner decides he wants to meet the airplane in Kansas City and fly via Oklahoma City over to Towson, New Mexico, and then back to Midland. And he's spending gas, but he's also spending money for that gas differently than the other partner did. So if they, if they put on a pat amount per gallon, um, you know, one partner wouldn't pay his fair share for one trip and then the other partner would pay too much for the other trip and it wouldn't be fair. So I designed this fair fuel algorithm that it takes the amount of fuel that is in the plane and the amount that it burns and then the amount of fuel that was purchased and how much that that fuel was purchased for. And it calculates based on the amount of fuel that was burned and the price of fuel of all the fuel that was in the tank. It could be 50 gallons of $5 fuel, 30 gallons of $4 fuel. It calculates the composite value of the fuel that's actually in the tank and then subtracts proportionately how much fuel that's actually in the tank to get a number of how much 
monetarily speaking, that that owner actually burned during that fly leg. Right. Like, if you were to do this on paper or in Excel, it would be it'd be burdensome, awkward, right. and livid with errors. But you have a, you put an algorithm in NAC and you feed it fuel, fuel price, and how much that you burned. You click go and it spits out the result. Hmm. Um, it puts it all in a, in a nice table. So when my, um, when our, well, when the lady who does the billing and invoicing looks at it, she just looks at the flat leg. Okay, partner one flew here and he needs to be billed $820.20 for the fuel that he burned. Right. She doesn't have to do anything, but it's a perfect calculation of how much responsibility that that owner has for how much fuel that he burned. Right. And a huge time savings that we're trying to do it in Excel or just guessing and not doing it accurately, you know, yeah. not, not, not being fair. Yeah. For the pilot side, it's just filling out the flight log. And for the person who does the billing and invoicing, she just pulls up the page, looks at the line, gets the number, and she puts on the invoice. They're so, so easy. So um, do, do, you have, do you have pilots entering data into NAC, like as they get fueled and, you know, yeah, yeah, they have to. And okay. brings up a good point of form rules there. So if an airplane is managed by us, we have to, we have to enter very specific information into the flight log form for each airplane. And we don't, we don't have to know everything, but we have to know um, certain things. Right. Um, we also do a lot of uh, contract pilot services too. So they'll ship me out to Dallas and I'll meet an airplane and I'll fly that airplane on a small trip. Now I don't need to know Hobbs time. I don't need to know fuel burn. I just need to know that I was there and put that on the database. Right. So I only need a form rule that says if, if we went out for a contract airplane and flew that airplane on a contract, then that form rule will collapse and say date, pilot, and time flown and notes. That's okay. all the stuff I need to know. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, in the background, you can have record rules too that, um, for a managed airplane, the record rules will say, you know, I flew this airplane and as a result, I need for these record rules to put dates here and fuel values here and where we landed here. And it's talking to all the other tables in my app because of the record rules. So I really love that part about NAC. There's the rules make it so much more powerful than Excel. Right. The, and the, oh, oh, yeah, Carl yesterday was saying that his favorite feature of NAC is the rules. I mean, condition, conditionary rules, uh, the turn, ternary operators that you mm-hmm. can put into a formula, the record rules, form rules, that makes things so much cleaner and more predictable. Right. And you feel like you have more control about how the data is flowing. In fact, sometimes it's absolutely necessary to put a rule there. And I don't know what we would do without the right. ternary rules. I, I always say protect the user from themselves when they're putting data in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. As a yeah, as Carl would say, the uh, the, the sanctity of data. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love I love his eloquence. Right. Yesterday to say that. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Well, that's that's really cool. Uh, I've learned a lot. I mean, just watching you, I didn't know about the flows in Twilio, and I, I love the way you diagram things out. Um, you know, any any final thoughts? Anything else you want to add before we end up here? Yeah. So I really enjoy data. I really enjoy databases, and you know, I'm on a personal level. You know, I'm a I'm a Christian. And in my worldview, 
I, I believe that, that God created everything and mm. God created the rules. And he, he created the way that math works and universe works and the way that data talks to each other and formula talks to each other. And it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, I can sit back from my app and I know that the data and the formulas is, is going to work every time just the way that I, I say it needs to work. Right. If I design a formula to do this incredible calculation, I want to know that that calculation will turn out true every time. And I call this the persistence of data. And it's something that I can rely on day in and day out. I can, uh, and I can deploy a product to my customers knowing that the formulas in there work for me. So they're going to work for my customer too. And uh, I, I love the way that it's designed because it reminds me that there are constants in the universe and there is a, a true truth and that, you know, we as, we as human beings, if we try to survive on poetic truth, we won't get very far. Eventually we're going to, we're going to break mm -hmm. and, and we're going to, uh, we're going to turn the wrong way. Um, and I was reading in Joshua 24, just this morning and the timing couldn't be better for this. Now Joshua is giving his last, uh, his last talk to the Israelite people before he dies. And he said, if it seems evil for you to follow the Lord, then you make that decision today. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. He said, don't, don't slide, you know, don't backslide, don't, don't wander. Just make the decision today to do that. He said, but for me, I'm going to do what's right in God's eyes beginning today and every day. Right. And a line in the sand. Yes. He said, this is going to be it. I'm, I'm going to be true to the Lord this day. And, you know, data reminds me of that, the way that it works. It functions the right way every day, day in, day out. And, uh, you know, I want to be that way as a person. I want to be that way in my faithfulness to God. I want to be that way in my integrity to my clients and my integrity towards my family too. And I, you know, I'm rem reminded of the value of integrity every mm -hmm. time that I work with on my database. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's my ultimate value proposition of right. working with the data is it reminds me of true truth, which right. comes from a God. Yeah. So yeah. I, Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you showing us your work and sharing that with us. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very happy. Everything worked out for us today. Andy.